Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Brooklyn-based jazz guitarist and composer Liberty Hellman. During the late March 2020 quarantine in America, Liberty talked about how things began to ramp up and turned into what they are now, and his latest 2020 CD called Last Desert. Along with how he got into music, mentors, and so much more, he really opens up and it's a great interview. So please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. How you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? Oh, hanging in there. Are you, are you up in New York? I am. Okay. Yeah. So I guess that's the bigger question. How are you, uh, how are you doing up there? Well, you know, a little stir crazy. I'm home here with, uh, my wife and two kids. And so, you know, learning how much energy it takes to do homeschooling. <laughs> pretty intense. Yeah. Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. So. And, well, cool. Yeah, so we're doing all right, though. Nobody's sick or anything, so that's good. Good. That is good. That's really good. Well, hey, hopefully this will be a little bit of a, a waste. It's away from thanks. Just thanks for taking a minute to talk with me here at Neon Chat. No problem. Yeah, my pleasure. So let's talk about Last Desert, your your latest CD. Give me an idea of what your vision for this project was. Well, you know, I I have enjoyed working with the same guys for a few years now, and I kind of wanted to make sure I was continuing to grow the band and and really the the um the music is just sort of a culmination of of things that I've been working on over the years and and just trying to refine some ideas and find a couple of different ways to uh create some enjoyable stuff for the guys to play on and to showcase their talents and really make it about them in certain places you know. So perhaps, um, although the music is a little composery, I think it's actually not. It's it's actually fairly simple in a lot of ways too. Um, and I did, and like I said, I, I really wanted to give a, a, a lot of space for the guys to blow and express themselves. So I think I was trying to find a nice middle ground between, you know, my my writing and their playing being the feature. You know, but absolutely. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about where you were born and raised and kind of your childhood and how you got into jazz. Okay, well, um, I was born, technically, I was actually born in London. Uh, my mother happened to be be there for a little while before I was born, and then we came back to New York um, when I was six months or so, so right, right in the beginning there. So then I spent, we spent the... Uh, my first 10 to 11 years in New York, and uh, my dad was a musician in the beginning. Uh, he, well, he still is a musician. He's a drummer. And um, so we lived in Soho in the early 70s, and he had a rehearsal space in our in our loft and played a lot of music in there. And uh, my mom was also a singer, although she wasn't really pursuing it as a career so much after I was born, but... But uh, but there was just always a lot of music. It just kind of seemed like that's what people did in our family, you know. And uh, my dad played Todd Rundgren back in, in the 70s. He was in a band called Utopia, which is pretty well known among uh, some of the singer-songwriter progressive rock people. And uh, so there were a ton of people coming by. A really colorful environment. Um, I remember Todd coming by, and he had rainbow hair. <laughs> Uh, there was a time Taj Mahal came by to visit my mom. You know, he's their friends, and she has a lot of stories. She knew a lot of really interesting people in the rock and roll scene in the late 60s, like Jimi Hendrix most prominently, but a lot of other people. And so I was raised hearing a lot of these stories and seeing a lot of music, and so it was just natural um, to be a musician for me. Um, and then later on, when I finally was really trying to learn the guitar for real, say maybe when I was 13 or so. I started digging through my mom's record collection, and I and she loves to tell the story because there was some moment where I came to her and said, Mom, there's some really great music in here. And she sort of looked at me and she's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know? 
as if like she as if I thought she didn't realize how good it was because she had you know not only a lot of classic rock and blues records but she also had some great you know jazz records and, and among those records there was a bunch of Coltrane and a lot of Miles of course and and she had in a silent way which was a great break uh, a great crossover record because of hearing John McLaughlin play the way he did on that particular recording, it sort of showed me a way to bridge what I was doing with what jazz was. You know, it was kind of a gateway for someone who had mostly played, mostly been focusing on rock and pop and blues music to really hear how maybe I could start to understand that. And so as I brought that that to uh, one of my guitar teachers and asked about it, and then they suggested, oh, we should really maybe check out West Montgomery and Joe Pass and some of this other stuff. We really want to understand how people play jazz and what jazz is. So then, of course, that was my introduction to some more sophisticated harmony when it came to, like, the chord progression and stuff like that. So then I started taking jazz guitar lessons from a friend of mine um, who had been studying jazz for a few years before me. And so it took off from there. Then it was just down the rabbit hole, you know. Uh, that led to just a lot of listening and going back and finding, at the same time, going back to my mom's record collection and finding stuff like The Love Supreme and trying to deal with the emotional intensity and, and all the other stuff that went along with trying to understand that. So it just that be, began the journey. Then, then from there I went to school and, you know, I went to school in California Um Sonoma State University, which at the time had a great jazz program run by a, a bass player named Mel Graves. And Mel uh, was a really creative guy. He's very smart. And um, by that point, I had my tapes had gotten pretty wide, and I had brought in some stuff around the time that the Dave Holland Quartet uh, Extensions record came out. And I brought, I remember bringing that to him and saying, I really want to try and play stuff like this. And, and so he was, uh, you know, gave me assignments to transcribe everything and figure, you know, we would listen to it and try to figure out how the music was working. And so he was very, he was very helpful in helping me find my, my own, helping me refine my tastes and my own interests as a player and as a composer. So I give him a lot of credit for that. And there was a great faculty there as well. So it was a really great place to be. And it was nice to not be in New York at that time, actually, um, uh, because I had considered maybe trying to come out here and go to Manhattan school or something like that. But it also felt like it was nice to be in a place where you weren't under the microscope of the jazz industry, you know, which came, which when I finally came back to New York in 99 or 90, um, it was apparent that it was nice to be able to kind of work on your, somewhere like that where you were free to be creative and not have so much uh, professional pressure. And then to come to New York and feel like you had a little bit more of your personal voice identified uh, before you were exposed to the possible New York Times review or some jazz great come to your gig or whatever, you know. <laughs> so yeah. it, it kind of had a positive. Um, anyway, I can keep talking, but I don't know if that I've already gone past what you've asked for, you know. <laughs> no, no, you're good. And I guess yeah. I want to kind of keep going with the influences here. Henry sure. Fredrick had to be a huge influence for you. What did you learn from him? Well, I continue to. I mean, we're still still doing it. Um, but, yeah, of course. I mean, we've spent 20 years uh, hanging with him. Um, and, yeah, well, Henry, you know, there's so many things about him that are inspiring. And, you know, one thing is just his work ethic is um, outstanding, and, and he's just always creative and interested in doing something. And he's really someone who demonstrates follow-through, which is like, you know, if he has an idea or a thought, he actually goes and does it, you know, which which I think a lot of people take for granted. I think sometimes people have ideas and they think, oh, this would be really cool, but then they get distracted and they don't do it, you know. <laughs> um, and I think that's more common than people want to admit. And I think Henry's one of those guys who pretty much always does what he says he wants to do. And, and so I find that very inspiring. And he's also not afraid to throw away work. You know, we've rehearsed so many pieces of music that were very interesting. But he really has a clear vision on what he's looking for. So he, 
you know, he'll bring in things and we'll rehearse it and he'll rearrange it during the rehearsal and then we may never play it again and he'll just bring in something else, you know. And so, and so, so he's constantly feeding, feeding the band and keeping us interested and, um, and also just really refining his work as we go along. And so he's not, uh, not overly committed to a piece of music, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, which is actually also, it's, it's an important lesson, I think, because you, you can really just try to focus on the cream of the crop. And then, you know, there are little specific things about the way he runs rehearsals. I mean, rehearsals are really fun. Um, it doesn't feel like work, you know. Uh, so it makes you want to go to rehearsal more than not, <laughs> which, I, you know, it's just kind of an interesting thing. I think sometimes people think of rehearsals as sort of work, you know. Um, and, I mean, there is a an element of that where you are working and refining things and making the band sound great, but actually – developing band camaraderie and making it really about sort of a there's a collective energy about us all hanging out together and working on the music that uh you know you feel much more invested it's not just a gig you know it's sort of a lifestyle so i think that that's another great lesson uh and also the way he works on forms his forms are really unique he's always you know every every piece of music has a different form and, uh, so I find that to be super interesting. And that's probably one, one of the more obvious things that I try to bring into my own music because it's something that I, I think is something that I can do naturally in my own music is have fun playing with forms. So that's a big influence. But then there's maybe a more obvious things, just like the simple fact that his melodies are really strong. And, um, even when the music gets abstract, um, he's always on the way to some kind of a groove that's very strong, like rhythm, you know, like the, some really strong rhythm stuff that's always on the way. And it makes the music more accessible, I think, even though, uh, even though it can seem very abstract, but I think like the element of groove and strong melody makes everything work pretty well for him, you know. So that's another big influence. What do you like best about being a professional musician? Well, um, that's very interesting. I, I I love the experience between uh, sharing the artwork uh, with an audience, you know, being in the room with people and playing music. Um, it's a certain kind of emotional and intellectual exchange that happens. I think that it's it's uh, it's really important. It's a it's a way for people to uh, experience a certain type of feeling and community and a feeling of community that is beyond just sitting at home listening to music, you know. So so really, you know, playing, playing, both playing with the other musicians is one side of the experience and then playing for an audience is, you know, it's another level. So that's my favorite part. Um, and, and it's just so great because uh, no two musicians are alike. So um, this is a very interesting way of sharing a part of yourself with other people. And, uh, and being creative. Um, and it's, you know, for me, it's, I'm better at that than I am at painting or something, you know. <laughs> so, so as, in terms of artistic expression, that's what I can, that's what I can give the most of, you know. So, right on. Yeah. So, why do you love jazz? No, I mean, jazz is, um, jazz is not about selling, you know. Um, so for me, you know, jazz music is really it's a creative art form. It's about the power of improvisation, and um, it's really about communication. It's a shared language between the musicians, and so it makes it um, extremely unpredictable. Um, at its at its best, it can be really super exciting and unpredictable, and um, and cathartic too, depending on you know what kind of piece it is. And so I think that the the depth of it. Um, kind of reaches beyond um, most popular music. That's not, you know, there's, there's always going to be exceptions um, with, with any great music. You know, there's a lot of great pop music and great blues and that has the same sort of effect. But I think jazz maybe has an unlimited um, capacity for change and um, and for just being very expressive and you can play it differently every night. You know, you're not expecting to go on tour and just play the same set over and over again. Um, so I, so I think it gives you a lot of, uh, leeway as a musician, you know, so 
I guess you could say sometimes it's a little indulgent because it's not a, a financially prosperous industry, you know. But um, but I think it offers a certain kind of expression that you don't really get playing other kinds of music. So I really I really love it, and people who love it, I think they feel the same way, you know. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so yeah. That. that's all that. Yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. So when we finally get past the coronavirus and the world comes back alive and live music begins again, what do you hope the audience realizes or what revelations do you hope that they have when they come back out and watch jazz again? Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I have to be less specific and just say that I hope that that society as a whole starts to realize how much, you know, we all need to depend on each other and how vulnerable everyone is. You know, it's, um, you know, when you, when, even when I remember being a teenager and telling people I was going to be a musician and, you know, you get a lot of comments from your friends, parents or other people who say, Oh, are you sure that's a good idea? You know, it's so hard to make sense of an office. But then, you know, you'd be hard pressed to ever meet a person who didn't listen to music. You know what I mean? And so, I, there's a kind of a disconnect um, between like what's considered necessary in, in life and what isn't, and it's hard to find people who actually don't agree that arts and music are necessary for a thriving society. Um, but yet, uh, most people are fine to not pay for it or whatever, or they don't really go out and support as much. Even if they like it, they stay home and watch Netflix instead. And you know, I, I just hope that people maybe realize that it's so it's going to be really hard for a lot of artists to come back to business uh because you know like for example I've lost half a year's worth of work and because of the low margins that a lot of jazz musicians live on um by the time it starts revving up again you know we may not be gigging in full force for a whole year even if the economy starts you know if stores start opening all that within 2 months or 3 months uh, it's going to take a lot longer for a lot of us to get back in business. So, because it takes time to plan gigs and tours and things like that, you can't just start doing it. <laughs> you know, you can't just say it's Easter and start going gigging again. You know, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> so, yeah. I just hope that people, re- you know, feel a little bit more like they want to spend time in, with the arts and culture and and um and have a more uh, welcoming attitude towards things like healthcare and and other things that just would keep people from feeling like the bottom could fall out and that there is no and that there is no nothing there to help you from falling out which i think every right now there's a huge part of america and the world that feel that way so it's it's more about the way we treat each other as a whole society not just about jazz you know <laughs> but but in, yeah. you know i have my own perspective from where I am, but but I think that I want us all to kind of think about how we can do better when we get back to normal. Like, what can we do to prepare ourselves for the next one? Because there's no reason to think that it won't happen again. So there it is, you know. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So my final question to you is this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, that you're living your life. Who do you think you are? Oh, Wow. That's a very interesting question. <laughs> who, do I, uh, who do you think you are? <laughs> who do you think you are? <laughs> um, you know what? I, I don't know. That I I just feel that I'm one of many artists who are just trying to to be myself. You know, trying to be the best version of myself. I lead by example, that saying that it's possible to be a creative person. And to do something, you know, to find a place for your art to exist you know, among all the other art that's out there, you know. So I'm just trying to be a snap person who believes in, in that lifestyle and who wants to contribute uh, something positive and interesting to the world. And uh, so I just, I'm just trying to be a person who shows that it's possible to do that. And that's really all it is, you know. Other, whether or not I'm, I succeed at it or I'm good at it is for other people to judge, you know. But um, but I just want to be a person who does it, you know. So that's it. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Well, hey, 
Liberty, I got to say before we get off that my hometown was is Liberty, Missouri. So oh, <laughs> it cool. has resonated with me for quite a while. Hey, stay good. safe. Good luck up there. And thanks again for your time. All right, thanks. Thanks for listening and tuning into another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Liberty for his time, music, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends, and please support the arts. Jazz.